calculus here at Valparaiso University today. Uh, professor Edwards is a university distinguished professor uh, of engineering at Virginia Tech. And I follow the science that he does. I am, I am uh, completely impressed by all of his publications and his honors. I will share a few of them with you. In 2016, he was named among the Time, Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Uh, and by Fortune Magazine, the world's 50 greatest leaders. Political mag Magazine's top 50 visionaries who have transformed American politics. Foreign Poly Policy Magazine's 100 World's Greatest Thinkers. Um, he's had a great impact with his science in society. Uh, something I personally admire. And again, just very, very grateful that you're here with us today to share your work. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome. <laughs> Really, just thank you so much for having me today. And the president couldn't have said it better when he talked about the mission of Alpro being to seek the truth and wherever it takes you, that's so be it. And I kind of think back on where this journey started. First, I, I thought the best place to seek the truth was in the laboratory. Uh, but then in 2003, I was working with the EPA on a lead and water problem in Washington, D.C., and I was soon asking too many questions and fired by the EPA, and that <laughs> set me out on a whole different kind of truth-seeking expedition. And since that time, I, I kind of characterize what I've been doing as like turning over rocks, and I promised myself when something slimy didn't crawl out, I would end this and go back to the lab, and here I am, because every rock I turn over, too frequently something slimy comes out. And I think one of the things you've got to uh, realize when you start working on a scientific problem is you want to you want to think about what's changing what are what are the mega trends that are driving this problem and that's really one where i want to start right here first off i'm going to make a point that some of the key drivers behind the problems that i'm going to talk about related to clean water for which the science is perfectly well understood we have laws to protect people but we're not following them First and foremost, it's, it's increasing um, world debt. Secondly, it's declining discretionary funding. Third, we've got cities and towns across America that are losing population, and that's creating infrastructure stresses. And we've also got plummeting public trust and water is not yet a human right. So I'm gonna talk briefly uh, about each of these key issues. So first, it does help to follow the one. And one of the problems that we have throughout the Western democracies is on an any kind of normalized basis, we've got skyrocketing debt of all sorts. We're in truly uncharted territory here, wherein as of 2018, um, global debt outstanding is 325% of GDP. And if you study these kind of bubbles throughout history, what you realize these, these always end badly one way or another. The second thing is that we've never really had a good way in human history to deal with bankruptcy or indebtedness. That's a fact. Uh, if you go back uh, 200 years, um, you know, debt always means loss of freedom or tough decisions. And you know, in the wisdom of that era, uh, we would throw folks who couldn't pay their bills into debtor's prison. <coughs> And you would have no way of getting out of it because how are you going to pay your debts if you're in jail? So the you know the fallacy of that logic was present at that time, and it's still kind of present uh, with us to today. What do you do uh, with with cities and towns that have gone bankrupt? What do you do if countries like Greece go bankrupt? Uh, austerity is forced upon them, right? And so this is just a fundamental stress, no way of dealing with this issue. And then on top of that, one of the things that's driving our debt is we've made a lot of promises, promises we cannot keep to people in terms of uh, entitlement spending and other issues. And if you look at any um, congressional budget office projection uh, of the budget, what you'll see is that the implication is we have less and less 
discretionary money to spend. For all these problems that we're talking about, whether it's in opioids, whether it's PFOS, whether it's declining infrastructure, we're all in line for a smaller and smaller pie. And so when you get in this game, you have to have humility. How important is my cause in the grand scheme of things? Because there's no magic pot of money uh, that's going to overcome these structural problems. And on top of that, in many cities, we have population decline. And this is uh, indeed a mega trend. Now, in some cities, most famously Detroit and Flint, uh, it has to do, to do with economic factors. But there's also a mega trend that uh, existed throughout the century and it's now continuing, where there's a migration from rural America, particularly young folks, uh, to the coast, to the mega city. And we've got uh, a third of rural U.S. communities who are in population decline. And so what that means is they have a large infrastructure to pay for, uh, but no one or very few people with the ability to pay. And so their water bills, for example, are going to keep going up. The quality of the water is going to go down. And how do you get out of that? The only real solution uh, the end game of this are two. One is to get folks to move back to support that big infrastructure. Or two, eventually, um, as has been the case throughout history, many of these towns will end up as ghost towns. So, you know, these are hard realities. And amidst that, we're also struggling with just plummeting trust. Trust is plummeting in all kinds of institutions, um, whether it's government. Um, and this is happening all across the world. And this is a fascinating graph I found yesterday. It, it illustrates um, folks trust in government as a function of time with the uh, president. Uh, if there was an office in each of those times. And uh, one of the fascinating things about this is that we may have reached the bottom of what's achievable. <laughs> that, that actually happened, uh, oddly enough, in the Obama administration. And uh, you know, with the new administration, we haven't moved the needle at all. So it's interesting uh, what the hypothetical limits of this are. But, you know, this is a great change, you know, we're losing trust in our government, we're losing trust in all institutions. And that is creating great fear, much of it justified uh, in many quarters. There's a fascinating book uh, on this subject, this guy, uh, Michael Young, he's the first person to think about the implications of a meritocracy. The so-called meritocracy is something that came into being after World War I, when they started testing soldiers to give them positions of power, leadership, and many societies adopted that. And this was something new throughout history, because prior to that time, uh, things were not awarded on the basis of a so-called meritocracy. It was based on birth. And he was just thinking through, what are the implications of this? I mean, we, we haven't had something like this um, in history. He wrote this dystopian novel called um, The Rise of the Meritocracy. In this book, he actually first coined the phrase meritocracy. And it's interesting because he, in his mind, saw how this was going to play out. And he actually predicted, this was in 1958, that uh, the Western democracies would collapse under uh, anti-elitism. And he talked about the forces that would arise to make that happen. And this is quite fascinating. And in this book, he made many, many compelling arguments that were way, way ahead of his time. But one of the things he was talking about is if you want the meritocracy to not collapse, uh, there are certain things that you should do. Some things should not be distributed on merit. And those include education, health care, and police protection. And what he left off the list, and what I'm going to argue perhaps should be on it, is water. Uh, water as a human right that should not be distributed on merit. Because unfortunately, and this is just the cold hard truth, and that's the title of this talk, it's truth and consequences. Uh, the way we roll in this country is our current paradigm is you get the water you or your city can't afford, uh, period, okay? That's it. 
So we at Virginia Tech, we've been working on these problems now for 15 years, and we kind of formed a group that's looking at this issue with the um, really bizarre founding premise that we should not be telling folks their water is safe if it's not safe. Okay, this is all. This is the worst of all worlds to me, right? This is unacceptable. Uh, it's okay, in my opinion, if you want to be pragmatic and just say, "Look, we're going to get water to your house, and after that, it's your problem if you want to drink." Okay, that's that's a third world approach. That's the approach that we're taking uh, throughout much of America. Uh, or uh, we could say we do have federal laws, and those will be followed. And if you turn on your tap, you can trust that the water will be in those standards. And I'm going to show you that's not the case, unfortunately. And Americans are waking up to that fact. So what I'm going to do is talk about three different, four different case studies here that illustrate some kind of extremes in relation to our experiences over the years. Now realize we worked with about 150 different communities at this point. Uh, 97, 98% of those, we go in, we look for problems, we don't find anything out. And so we're in the position of giving people good news, that we looked, and for at least the things we looked at, we did not find problems. But here's four examples that affect significant populations in different ways that are emblematic of the types of problems that we see across the country. So first off, uh, we're going to talk about private wells. Now, private wells are fascinating because uh, there are no regulations at all. Okay? You're on your own, right? And so we can deal with that, right? So the way in which we deal with it is we work with private well owners to find out what's in their water. And if there's anything to be done, they have to do it. They're, it's 100% their responsibility. And so I work with about four different research scientists, and this is uh, Dr. Kelsey Piper, and this is her work. She started this with a, um, her dissertation work. And just for a point of comparison, one of the problems that we encountered during the Flint, Michigan water crisis was lead in water. And this is the results of our citizen science sampling uh, in August 2015 where uh, this team collected 269 samples around the city. There's a distribution because some houses don't have a lead pipe in front of it or have low lead in their plumbing. And so you have many houses with low lead and then you have other houses where they'll have a lead pipe and just horrible, horrible problems. So wide distribution. <coughs> but that is uh, kind of what <coughs> triggered the naming of this as the Flint water crisis was the lead issue. And if we plot what we've seen around um, Virginia in terms of lead and water on the same graph, uh, it's the exact same curve. So the levels of lead that were observed in Flint, Michigan during, during the height of the water crisis are virtually identical uh, to those experienced by private well owners in, in their daily use of water. And they're on their own. There's no, there's no federal law protecting them. Now, they can go buy bottled water, they can flush their lines, they can use filters, but um, we can work with them to, to fix this problem. Uh, another thing that's interesting is well owners deal with kind of some catastrophic events, and we've been starting working with those, specifically um, flooding. And what can happen in those situations is, uh, you know, the water comes and it comes over the top of the well and it floods in. And so, fecal matter, contaminants, everything can just run down your well pipe, and then you've contaminated your own water supply. And I know an earlier speaker said y'all didn't come here to uh, see, see slides of poop on slides, and uh, I didn't get that memo, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, anyway, here's mine. Um, <laughs> you know, if there were Olympics for strategic poop placement on a well, this, dog, this puppy would win it. <laughs> That was my dog. I'd go into counseling to see what was uh, what was going on there. But, um, anyway, this is the general idea. Like the water goes over the top of these wells, and you get fecal contamination. And um, what are you going to do about that? And so you add this all up. Like there's both chronic and acute problems in private wells. Uh, Sixty percent, roughly, of wells in Virginia exceed at least one health-based um, standard 
uh, for for water quality. And again, you're on your own. You know, if you own a well like me, that's your problem. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is kind of this imminent tide of bankruptcy uh, that we're going to be seeing in towns and cities across the United States. And in some ways, Flint was ahead of the curve in experiencing uh, the fiscal and other stresses um, that naturally result from that and paying a horrible, horrible price for it. And I also just want to take a step back and say this um, way in which we handle bankruptcy is, is somewhat uniquely American. Again, no one's figured out a way to handle it. But if you look at um, Canada or Germany, the whole idea that a city or town could go bankrupt and have to um, be forced austerity is, is not really an option, okay? Because uh, the state and the federal government will come up with money to help to make sure that those basic services are being provided. Not so uh, in the United States. Again, you're just on your own. <laughs> and so what I want to talk about now is um, kind of the events in Flint, Michigan, and how the residents dealt with that and kind of exposed uh, this problem where actually federal law uh, was being broken. And it was, it was done so with the full knowledge of the federal, uh, state, and local government. And this was events in uh, 2014, 2015, and I think um, what happened there is, is just truly, truly amazing. So this is how it started. Uh, the city was um, trying to save some money, and they switched to the local Flint River, and the projections were that this would save about four or five million dollars a year while a new pipeline was being built. And this is the now infamous ribbon cutting ceremony uh, where they said, um, the mayor said that this is a historic day for us. Um, and that turned out to be true, not quite, uh, for the reasons that they planned. Because someone forgot to follow federal corrosion control law. Okay, it's actually a federal law that says, thou shalt have corrosion control. Why? Uh, it's not to save money. Uh, well, it is the same. Okay, so for every dollar you spend on corrosion control, uh, you're actually saving ten dollars in reduced damage to your pipe <laughs> system. It's, it's as simple as like running your car on oil. But secondly, the corrosion control does other things. It keeps iron out of the water. It keeps lead out of the water. It keeps the bacteria levels lower. So these are all extra health benefits uh, that are just a consequence of this idea of saving money. Someone forgot, and the residents soon figured out that things had gone horribly wrong. So, you know, this is a picture of a collaborator, a Flint mom named Leanne Walters, um, who I first worked with in Flint. And what she's holding up is water that came out of her faucet after a filter. Mm -hmm. And that water has very, very high amounts of orange color. That's due to iron corrosion. That's why we have a corrosion control law. That would not be there if the law had been followed. And she's presenting this to the public, the, uh, the official overseeing this, and she's being told that, well, if that water came out of your house, trust me, it's safe. <laughs> Don't think so. so we later found out, because she saved this bottle, it mm. was not safe. Uh, some of the water from her house literally had two and a half times hazardous waste levels of lead, which is so high that a child drinking just a sip of that water could have their blood lead raised from zero to about five micrograms per liter level of concern, one sip. And so Leanne, she was interesting because she had a living experiment in front of her. She had two twin boys. Uh, the growth of one of those boys was being stunted and she was trying to figure out why. And so this mom actually figured out on her own that uh, the city did not have corrosion control. She reached out to a local um, EP employee, uh, you're gonna hear more about, Miguel Del Toro, who happens to be the foremost expert on the lead and copper rule in the country. He's not just any run of the mill person. And he heard what was going on, he could not believe it. He's like, this is, um, this is a serious, serious problem. And uh, so this mom and many other residents in Flint knew that something was going wrong. When we started thinking about getting involved, this is what we were seeing on social media. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that it wasn't just lead and water that was high. We later um, showed that 
in some large buildings, Legionella bacteria was also high, and there was roughly like 12 deaths that had been attributed um, to the presence of that bacteria. So it really did affect bathing and other things. So Miguel saw what was going on. He, he got to try to work within the system at first, right? That's the, the path of a whistleblower, right? You got to exhaust every opportunity. So Miguel's a very brave guy. He's near the end of his career, getting fired, you know, was just expected to him, I guess. And so um, he wrote an email saying that we should order an imminent substantial endangerment because the city is not following federal law. EPA should intervene. This is April. Uh, nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? Well, Miguel's boss uh, at EPA Region 5 didn't like to hear bad news because um, we might have to do our job. <laughs> and this was a chronic problem with her. Um, there was actually, around this time, a hearing, I'm not making this up, okay, you can go read the congressional record, where they were talking about Susan Hedman, who was the administrator, and they talked about this predator uh, at Region 5 who was harassing interns. And um, she actually led the retaliation um, against the people exposing this problem. And so when Miguel wrote his memo, he knew he would be retaliated against as well, and she didn't fail to disappoint. Um, so he actually uh, wrote a memo in July, because no, June, because nothing was happening, talking about this, documenting it for the press. An ACLU reporter got this. It was publicized. Again, the city was in imminent substantial endangerment. Federal law was being broken. This was absolutely clear, right? Miguel's doing his job, and at that point, um, he was told, quote, by the EPA ethics officer, never again to talk to anyone from Flint or about Flint again. So Miguel's out. And so the next day, he was a little bit depressed about this, and he wrote a, an email to his colleagues documenting his frustration. He goes, you know, I'm really tired of bad actors being defended bad actions being ignored, people doing the right thing as if being, being harassed as if we're doing something wrong. Uh, I truly, truly hate working here. EPA is accessible. <laughs> but he's out. And so this is kind of the situation um, in Flint. Uh, folks were marching in the streets. There were problems with rashes. This is the kind of water that was coming out of the tap. And oh, by the way, uh, this is amongst the most expensive water rates in the world. We actually documented this. So not only is the water really not suitable for drinking or bathing at that time, uh, it was also the most expensive water. And rightly so, people were frustrated. So um, at that point, we've been working behind the scenes and mainly trying to help assist Miguel in his efforts. But at that point, we also realized the system had failed. So, uh, we started a citizen science um, collaboration. Uh, this was August 13th, 2015. And we worked with a group of residents. Uh, and we provided the sample kits, uh, the analytical support, and the funding so that they could do the job that the EPA and the city and the state are supposed to do, but refused to. And that was really a game changer. And one of the things I'm, I, we also did is uh, we, what we call investigative science. So we submitted Freedom of Information Act requests to see who, what, when, and where. Uh, we got mountains of evidence. We posted that on our website. I'm just going to tell you, show you one of the emails that I'm, I'm particularly proud of. Um, it was an email where they're talking about us doing the sampling. And I'll just blow up the part I like. Uh, if we're going to take action, it needs to be soon before the Virginia Tech folks scandalize us all in D.C. A prior problem we worked on, it took us six years uh, to expose the problem. Uh, we were only, at that point, about a week into this. And that tells you something um, pretty important here. If, if taking a few water samples is going to scandalize a whole branch or several branches of government, uh, we've got a problem, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> And so uh, we started working uh, with a local pediatrician who wanted to repeat the blood lead analysis that I did to show a similar problem in Washington, D.C. Uh, back during the D.C. lead and water crisis. Uh, she did an amazing job. And within about a week, she was able to have a press conference. 
uh, Dr. Mona Hamatisha, and she's written a really, really good book on this, and I invite you to read it. It's a, it's a fascinating story. But uh, it took us, from the time we launched uh, this sampling campaign to the time it became front page in the New York Times, uh, it was six weeks. And it would not have been possible without this uh, amazing group of folks who stood up to make this happen. And it was uh, truly a privilege to be a part of it. And so uh, they had said to the residents that we can never again go back to the old water, to Detroit water. But once they realized that the lead in water was a problem and it was increasing the blood lead of children, uh, they figured out a way. Um, so that happened. And at that point, it started to become kind of a, a national and international media sensation because, as you know, if you're judged by how you treat your most vulnerable, you don't look very good. And as a society, we did not. And so President Obama declared a federal emergency. And a lot of donations started flowing to Flint. And FEMA resources were mobilized to blood lead test the children. And Flint's infrastructure was in horrible, horrible shape before this, but 18 months of corrosion, without corrosion control didn't help either. And uh, this is a main break um, that occurred. And so you get an idea, like civilization as we know it had effectively ended for many residents of this country living in Flint, Michigan. So too, that is happening around the country. And it was on, it was around January of 2017, we shared data that showed Legionella was high in Flint hospitals, that the lack of corrosion control also probably triggered a Legionella outbreak, and there were about 12 deaths associated with it. So, you know, all of this happened, and, you know, you kind of look at this and you go, okay, we, you know, we really got some problems in this country. You know, all these mega trends are kind of coming together, and it's disproportionately impacted certain parts of the population. And I think the, the way this was best summarized to me was in a uh, Comedy Central clip that I'll share with you. I don't know if it's going to work. But... Okay, it's not going to work. Okay. So um, anyway, Trevor Noah gets on there and gave a shout out to all his friends in Africa. And he said, please um, give money to save a village in America. <laughs> and help them get the clean drinking water uh, that they need. And so that's kind of what we need. We need a slap across the face to show, you know, ask the question, what kind of society do you want to live in? Um, around that time, Susan Hedman um, resigned. When I later went to Region 5, I didn't know like how I'd be received. And uh, my employees were bringing me into their office and high-fiving me and thanking me. So apparently, uh, this was a popular thing that happened. <laughs> but, you know, what we really learned in the aftermath of Flint was something that I had been speaking out on, as had many others which is that this is a national problem. So the cheating that occurred in Flint was not really unusual. Uh, there was a Guardian study that showed uh, 33, at least major US cities, were cheating to make lead and water look low when they sampled it, when it was actually high when consumers were drinking. And even though that cheating was a hurt, uh, occurring, there are 5,000 US water systems that are still exceeding uh, the lead standard. So, this is not an isolated problem. Okay, what was unusual in Flint is they got caught and people kicked. And when news of this started to spread, rightly so, it started to undermine trust in drinking water all around the country. It's part of that spiral of lost trust in government and all institutions. And how do you reverse that? But uh, it's, it's got this every person for themselves mentality, right? So bottled water sales started skyrocketing uh, in the aftermath of Flint, as did sales of lead filters. And this is just a natural consequence of people around the country going, how can I trust my water supply? Uh, and once it reaches a certain point where it's like 10% of the water systems are proven to be cheap, cheap Andy, let's say even 90% are being honest, right? How do you know which city you're living in? You know? And so you reach this tipping point where, where trust is justifiably lost. And uh, they actually tested for lead in the US Congress. And this was 2016, and that was high again. That seems to be a chronic problem. And I think it 
um, can explain a lot of the dysfunction we see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different subject. <laughs> so, you know, um, this was uh, really an epic thing. Um, about 600 million in total relief has been promised to um, Flint. Not all that's been delivered yet. This is truly a start for kind of a man-made disaster, like $67,000 per child in the city in some sort or another, you know, whether it's bottled water or free health insurance or other things. And now I want to shift gears and, and talk about, you know, just a huge problem that, that's occurring in rural America. And uh, we got a couple quick examples to talk about there. One is uh, St. Joseph, uh, Louisiana. Now this was uh, in the aftermath of Flint. Uh, this has got all the symptoms, uh, a population decline of 30%, uh, roughly 80% African American, 40% uh, below the poverty line per capita income, $9,000. And uh, this is the water that was coming out of the tap in St. Joseph. <laughs> and once again, uh, they were being told this water was safe. And when we got called, we started going, okay, well, let's see what evidence there is that this is actually safe. Um, here's some more social media um, talking about this. And once again, you're paying amongst the highest water rates in the world because there's very few people left to pay for the water. And so just documenting like what was going on, it turned out that the state was doing their job. They were finding violations. These letters were going out to the city over and over again. Failure to monitor chlorine, failure to monitor chloroform. Uh, they didn't even write consumer confidence reports. Uh, fecal contamination of water. You wonder if anyone was opening the map. Because what are you gonna do? You know, in defense of the regulators, what are you gonna do, go turn their water off? And so uh, we asked the question, you know, is this civilization um, as we know it? And for me at least, it doesn't look like a first world situation. And so we go and provide relief to folks living under dictators in other countries. And so we again went and said, okay, let's take a few samples, see what's going on. And this was really um, all the work of an amazing woman, Adrienne Kantner uh, from LSU, who collaborated with us. So, um, she was first kind of working with the community trying to raise this um, you know, profile where you could go and um, kind of sign on to a uh, memo to the White House to say, hey, this is our water, can someone help us? And that petition didn't really go anywhere because only 13,000 people signed it. And to reach critical mass to get White House attention, you've got to hit 100,000. So um, Adrian and others went and collected samples in the city and these are the lead results that she got. And what we were able to show is that in some houses, lead was above the 15 part per billion federal standard. And at that point, uh, there was a panic. Because, um, quote, the same team that had worked with citizens in Flint were now in Louisiana. And Louisiana, quote, did not want to have the next Flint on their hands. And so what happened uh, was something unprecedented. The government then called a public health emergency. And um, they actually came up with an incredible amount of money for a town this size, $9 million. Then we had a problem, okay, how do you get the money to the folks to fix the problem? Well, the mayor of the town had to sign the documents. And for a long, long time, he wouldn't sign it. And no one could figure out why. And one of the key steps in getting the money there is you had to do a financial audit to see what's going on to show that you can handle the money. And it turned out um, that audit exposed that um, his family was dipping into the town money. Uh, they were taking money. They didn't want to do the audit. Um, and eventually, um, we had to work around this to actually even get the money. You know, so there's all kinds of barriers here that you wouldn't even think about. But here's the famous. Um, ribbon cutting, quote, groundbreaking ceremony here. And the state has said, look, we're gonna help this community. Now, we know there's hundreds of other communities in uh, Louisiana that have very, very similar problems. Quote, the simple fact of the matter is we can't replicate this effort around the state because we don't have enough money. So if any of you all think that you're gonna try this again, it's not gonna work. 
And so when citizens did try it again, basically the state just started issuing violations and telling them to fix their own problems. You know, that's that's because the state doesn't have money either, you know. So I now want to shift gears to another uh, city we worked with. It's a fascinating issue in Denmark, South Carolina. And this was uh, documented uh, late last year, CNN, 30 Minutes. It's called Dirty Water. And in this case, two residents reached out to us. It was uh, Paula and Eugene uh, Brown. And we worked with them closely. They were convinced something happened to their water 10 years early to make it itchy, to cause bathing problems. And we said, okay, we're gonna start on this journey. We're gonna make a list of 20 things we have to do. And um, we went through the bacteriological, uh, the disinfection byproducts, the, the lead, the copper, chlorine, everything. We got through 19 out of 20. Um, and everything looked fine. The last thing we needed to do was inspect the wells and see what was going on. And that's city property. And we were told that we could do that. So um, I got in the car, I got partway on this five hour drive to go inspect the wells, and I got a call, no, not today. Three more times um, that happened. And I'm finally going, are you ever going to let me inspect the wells? And uh, I got the mayor on tape saying, no, I'm never going to let you inspect it. So you're like going, okay, why? You know, what's the problem here, right? We've already shown 19 or 20 things are okay. I don't know if you're hiding anything, but you're sure acting like it, right? So um, anyway, uh, we later found out, um, we were reading reports and we discovered they were adding this pesticide to their water supply um, called halosin. And this pesticide is illegal. It's not approved for drinking water use. And some of the symptoms are exactly what Eugene and Paula uh, were reporting and oh, by the way, it was dosed to the water within six months of when they first started complaining, 10 years earlier. So um, yeah, this was on CNN, and um, there's a big lawsuit associated with this, obviously, uh, because you shouldn't be putting things into water that are not approved to be put in water. And we probably will never know all the health effects because there's almost no human health data associated with this. So we've really got a huge, huge mess on our hands. Um, and so the residents now believe, and rightly so, their fears have been justified. We don't have reason to think the water is still dangerous, but you know, once trust is lost, good luck getting it back. And you know, this is what I'm talking about. We're really just third world um, when it comes to drinking water. Uh, in these poor communities. And so uh, the very last thing I want to cover really quickly is something that happened in Iredale, North Carolina. And this is something being in the right place, the right time, or the wrong place, the wrong time, depending on your perspective. But we had these hurricanes, and we do a lot of work with private wells. And we had a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation. We also have funding from EPA to look at lead and water problems with well systems. And little did we know what we were getting into because uh, this has been a big battlefield uh, because there's a lot of coal ash being spread around North Carolina. Uh, it's been a huge fight. There was a cancer cluster identified there. And uh, there's all this debate about whether there's a link between the coal ash and the cancer clusters. And so here we are during the midst of this flood, like sampling, and people are getting starting to lose their minds because why are you collecting samples? Uh, and what might we find out? And so we got an incredible um, response. Uh, members of my team went and they handed out sample bottles to these private well owners. This was February 20th to 27th this year. Uh, we had 200 residents participate in the first four hours. All our bottles were gone. We had to make emergency shipments there. We eventually got nearly 800 bottles uh, distributed. And uh, it was this huge production where the local church uh, made its services available. Everything was free. Everything was like just contributing. Let's get our water tested. So there was this huge traffic jam with people dropping off, picking up the bottles. We had the QAQC um, on the site and kind of wing it as we went. And uh, that's the amazing team that um, really pulled that off. And they worked overtime to analyze those samples. And we haven't even presented the results yet, but um, and this has been a long fight, but just 
four days ago, Duke agreed to, um, well, the, the state said that Duke had to um, excavate this coal ash uh, and put it in line landfill. And so we're going to be presenting our results in a couple of weeks, but here we are. We didn't even have to present the results, you know, and uh, folks are sort of doing the right thing. Um, go figure. So um, shifting gears, you know, um, this has been an interesting journey. All of this is kind of outside my work at the university. Uh, the general rule, if you do this kind of work at a university, if things go bad, it's all your problem. If things go good, it was all their idea. As long as you understand, that's how all institutions work. As long as you understand that, they're going to be just fine. But, you know, the dollars and cents of this, I worked on a prior problem of lead in Washington, D.C. Um, through my accounts at Virginia Tech, or what I donated, um, I spent an incredible amount of money on this. Uh, 1.2 million pound MacArthur um, Fellowship. Uh, in the end, it was covered up. There was zero dollars of relief that went to residents of Washington, D.C., even though the lead problem there that we, we exposed was 30 times worse than what happened in Flint. So that's a whole other story. Uh, but, you know, as far as return on investment for the folks who were harmed, um, nothing. Uh, Flint was uh, an anomaly, obviously, lead and Legionella both. Um, our total out of pocket uh, that we spent was uh, $300,000 uh, through the first year. Uh, we eventually got a lot of that back through GoFundMe, by the way, after it became you know, an international sensation. I just started getting checks uh, in the mail. Uh, it was insane. Go to your mailbox and there's like five checks, some, anywhere from $70,000, that was the anomaly, um, to $1. But um, $600 million, um, in relief, you know, that's a pretty good return on my little investment there. Uh, of course, all our, our labor was um, donated. St. Joe's, um, we spent 20000 there. Uh, they got $8 million in relief, but the $400 to $1 return for the residents. And I already, we, you know, we just came at the last minute. We weren't with the most important actors here. Uh, we did freak people out totally that we were sampling, um, and so, uh, yeah, that will never be recreated again. Um, so with that, I'll just remind you, um, you know, we're here uh, to seek the truth. Um, you can do that within the university lab. Uh, Albert Einstein once sought the truth in physics, but later in life he became kind of more of a humanitarian, and things he said. Uh, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Mm -hmm. And I think he had quite a bit of wisdom. So that'll just open up for any questions you might have.